Hello and welcome. I'm Rick Burke, the co-founder and executive editor of STAT, and I'm glad to be here to moderate this important conversation. It's the first in a year-long series of programs at the Harvard Chan Studio entitled Public Health at the Brink. This could not be a more timely moment to look at the turmoil at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As, as many of you no doubt know, late yesterday, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky announced plans to revamp the agency and hired an outside group to conduct a month-long review to look at strategic change in the agency. The, the collection of individuals here to discuss the CDC and the news yesterday um, is, you know, I can't imagine a better, a better group um, or more qualified group. Uh, we have four former CDC directors here. Let me introduce them chronologically. Bill Fage led the agency from 1977 to 1983 under Presidents Carter and Reagan. Bill Roper was at the helm from 1990 to 1993 under President George H.W. Bush. Julie Gerberding was the CDC director from 2002 to 2009 under George W. Bush. And Robert Redfield ran the agency from 2018 to 2021 under President Trump. Tom Frieden, who led the agency for eight years under uh, President Obama, had a conflict and was unable to make this live discussion, but he did send us a couple of thoughts by video. Let's, let's dive in right away initially with the, uh, the news yesterday um, from uh, Director Walensky, who's looking at strategic change um, in several major areas at the agency, from the public health workforce, to data modernization, to lab capacity, to health equity, to pandemic response. Um, let me uh, go around and just ask you uh, your initial reaction to this. And is it enough? Is it too much? What's your reaction? Who wants to go first? Well, Rick, I would say it's very healthy to ask for outside help. And uh, I don't know if this is going to be enough. I think there are a number of things that should be looked at. I've uh, been pushing for the National Academy of Medicine to actually do something in this area of, of asking the question, what are the skills? What's the knowledge we need? What is the technology? What's the science that CDC needs to stay at the cutting edge? And uh, so this may be a beginning for that. So I'm all in favor of uh, looking for help. Dr. I can chime in, Bill. I, I really agree with, with, with Dr. Fagey. I, I would also say that um, it's important to not just have this focus on the CDC per se, because what really I think the pandemic has revealed to us is that our entire public health system is in need for some modernization and some additional support. So we need to really hear from our local health officials, our state health officials, territories and tribes, but also our schools of public health, which have to be a very important part of the modernization of the science and bringing to bear the most emergent technologies and sciences that we're going to need to bring the agency into the next generation. Dr. Roper. Yeah, I was just going to agree with now my two, soon to be three colleagues. Uh, there's nothing to uh, be lost, a lot to be gained with inviting others to give input to the process of re-examining the CDC's mission, mission and organization and work and so on. Uh, I think Dr. Walensky would be the first to say not everything has been perfect. Uh, it's, it's important to be striving for uh, in, improving things. Um, the one caution I would pose is uh, this needs to be done as rapidly as possible because heavens, you can create a scope so big and so complicated that we can do a 10 year study and it wouldn't, wouldn't really be enough. I think her calling for a one month review is a, a very smart idea. And I encourage this to, because it, it will never be done. CDC needs to be constantly renewed, but, it needs to get on. 
Dr. Redfield? Yeah, my only comment, I'd agree with my colleagues. I think it's really important that our nation look critically at a proportional investment in our public health capacity. As Julie said, it's not just CDC, it's the entire public health system of, of the United States. And I do think there's real opportunity to get a much greater proportional investment as Rochelle commented, whether it's data modernization, whether it's workforce capacity, whether it's laboratory resilience, whether it's our global health pandemic footprint response. So, you know, the agency has evolved over the years. And I would say one of the most important missions that it has is public health response. And to do that, there needs to be a substantial increase in the investment strategy that our nation has in public health in this country. What you're all describing is sort of, it's sort of an overwhelming challenge for the agency and for public health. And it's sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of an intrinsic systemic issues across the board. Where would you, if you had to pick one thing, where would you start? Uh, Dr. Fagey, where, if you, if you were talking to Dr. Walensky, there's a laundry list of things that need to be done. And as Dr. Roper said, it's not going to happen overnight. It's a constant thing, but where would you start? Well, Rick, will you let me have two starts instead of one? <laughs> one start is, you know, CDC has never had national authority over what states do in public health. And yet we haven't had the problems we're having right now. In the past, uh, if there was even an outbreak investigation, CDC had to be asked by the state or a county or a city or a tribe to do that investigation. They couldn't just go out and do it. And yet the system worked so well that it was never actually a problem. We didn't need more authority. Now the trust has been lost and it's trust that holds a coalition together. And so it's very important to reestablish that trust. And I think if CDC would have a series of meetings with health officers from states, counties, cities, tribes, that they could come up with how do we seamlessly approach public health problems in the future. So that would be one thing. The other one would be what we've already discussed, that we have to review what we need in the way of technology and science and uh, information for CDC to do all of this correctly. Dr. Roper? Yeah, I, I would make a point that we could talk about for the full hour, but um, one of the most important things to get clarified with regard to CDC is what is its mission? And uh, I'm not so much talking about the scope of diseases or ailments that are considered, but rather what is it doing with regard to science and politics and public health? And uh, one of the things that is frequently said, and I think meant well when people say it, is we need to get the politics out of public health. That is never going to happen. That's, frankly, in my view, a naive notion. Uh, we need science, the best of science, to guide the decisions that are made by political leaders to implement effective public health programs. So we need a constructive working together of science and the, the political process. And by that, I mean the best of the way we make decisions in a democratic society. We need those two things working together for public health to be successful. One of the things that has been an issue of late with CDC is people have said it's been too political or not political enough or whatever. And I think the best solution to that is a recognition that CDC is not a political agency. It is a scientific agency, just like the NIH is, but in a different sector of science and medicine. But, but and, let me ask you, let me ask you, hasn't that hampered the CDC in some ways? I mean, it, you know, based in Atlanta from the very beginning, it's away from Washington, away from, it's tried to be non-political, but, but hasn't that cost it in terms of um, influence in, in from, from the various administrations? We're never going to redo what happened in the late 1940s. CDC's in Atlanta, and that's <laughs> on the whole a good thing. But the issue of how is the scientific advice from the CDC incorporated into the 
the president and his administration and then interfaced with the Congress and their guidance and oversight and so on. That's a really important process. And I think the issue that we face is not so much a scientific question any longer. If I can be blunt about it, it's our dysfunctional political system. And so the, the fact that things are off in, in crazy directions, uh, if I can be blunt about it, is not CDC's fault. It's the political system. And so that can't be solved by even the wisest people that Dr. Walensky invites in. My suggestion, I guess, is to unabashedly say CDC is a scientific agency and we will give the best advice to the public at large, to the political leaders at large, and then work with them. One hopes to have effective implementation of those programs. Let, let me ask Dr. Gerberding, um, first of all, get, I'll give you a shot at, at saying the one thing that you would address first. But before you do that, do you agree with uh, Dr. Roper that the CDC should stick stay in Atlanta? If you could wage your uh, match. It's, a, it's it. a moot point. It is in Atlanta, and it, I think, has made a very good demonstration of the value in that location, as well as the challenges. Um, to, to initiate a conversation about moving the CDC would be a waste of everyone's time and energy. It's not really where it's located. It's how does it interact with the department, with the White House, and with the Congress. And those are things that I think all of us have solved in various ways through the years. There's no question that those relationships are important, but I'm not sure they're going to be better or worse based on the geographic location right. of headquarters. Now, and with respect to your question about where would I start, I, I, I've, I actually really agree with my colleagues on this one. Um, if I could add anything to that, I would probably say, again, really looking at the emergent sciences, and I include in their data science, because I think that's a real opportunity for the agency. But, you know, I also don't want to have our viewers left with the impression that everything is broken at the CDC. There's incredible science going on there. There is incredible evidence of ongoing capacities in outbreak investigations and in chronic diseases, environmental health, birth defects. So we have to be careful that we don't paint the entire agency with a black brush when in fact there are a lot of really good things happening. That's, that's a fair point. Dr. Redfield, what, what's the single thing you would do? You talked about a data modernization. Is that your primary? Uh, I think it's a critical tool for CDC uh, to have real-time data that one can then, you know, execute a public health response. I think it needs to continue to enhance its ability to be a public health response agency. I know I always felt a little embarrassed every night when I came home and watched the nightly news. And it's nothing against my father's alma mater where he went to medical school, Johns Hopkins. But I always thought it was bothersome that the data the nation used to track the epidemic was from, from a, a medical school rather than CDC. So I do think there's an enormous need for CDC to be the hub of a public health data modernization, which Julie commented is not just a CDC public health uh, data modernization, it's the whole nation that has a real time public health data system that can be used for a public health response. I do think that's fundamental. Related to the Atlanta question, um, one of the things that I do think CDC would benefit from is to expand its decentralization. We have many people that are CDC employees that are detailed to different states, local, tribal, territorial health departments. I think that it would be useful to expand that public health workforce so that we have a, a public health workforce that's pre-positioned throughout the nation, and I would argue throughout the world, that can be used for that public health response. What, what, how, what's your response to the question about the CDC is, is viewed as too political and needs to move away from that? Well, there's no question. I agree with my colleagues. I, mean, I agree with Bill. I mean, the, the reality is that public health is always going to have a political tone to it. But I do think, uh, you know, this is where I think, and we will disagree with some people, Tom Friedman in particular, 
Um, I think there's an advantage to get the CDC director to be appointed similar to the FBI director, where it's a seven to 10 year appointment. I think there's an advantage for that director not to have a uh, response to the Secretary of Health, but to be independent and to be able to run that job, he or she, as they feel is in the best interest. So I do think there's some structural opportunities mm -hmm. to help reinforce independence because the public health advice that the CDC gives the nation has to be independent of the politics. The po politicians will do what they want to do with that advice, but the agency for credibility for the American public has to be viewed as politically independent. Dr. Fage, you had I know you had wanted to jump in. Two quick points. Uh, this meeting on Zoom should put to rest the question of where CDC has to be physically. I mean, it just <laughs> it makes no sense to argue that anymore. But I would like to, the second point is to totally agree with Bill Roper. Don't separate public health from politics. Public health is totally dependent on politicians it's one part of the medical system that has a single payer system. And why? Because politicians decide on the appropriations. Our question should be, how do we incorporate politicians into the solutions so that they really see themselves as part of the solutions and not just the place that gives money? Thank you. Let's now, um talk about something that Dr. Redfield just brought up about confirming the, the, the position. I know um, senators in both parties are getting behind the idea of making the CDC director a confirmed position by the Senate. Um, and I know in our, in our video conversation with Dr. Frieden, we asked him about that. So let's, let's start the conversation on that by listening to a clip from him. Um, he takes a different point of view than, than Dr. Redfield about uh, the, the question of uh, uh, confirmation, confirming the CDC director. Let's listen to this. Proposed reforms included in the bipartisan Prevent Pandemics Act are moving through Congress, and much of what's in the bill is greatly needed. But there's also language that would require that the CDC director be Senate confirmed rather than appointed as is done now. Making this position Senate confirmed would politicize the process of naming a new director with contentious partisan debate, delaying confirmation, potentially in the middle of a health emergency. There's also a risk that people will be nominated not for their technical expertise or ability to manage a public health problem, but for their industry or political connections. Although intended to make the agency more nonpartisan, making the CDC director a Senate confirmed position would likely do the opposite and it's a dangerous idea. Let me hear from the other three. Um, dangerous idea, Dr. Gerberding, what do you think? You know, I've thought about this a lot and I see both sides of it, but I have to say net net, especially given the, as Dr. Roper put it bluntly, the complications of our political system right now, I just can't see that this is going to be part of the solution. I think it's going to worsen the situation, not make it better. Dr. Roper? Yeah, I, I tend to favor the notion of having the Senate uh, advise and consent to the appointment. There are some additional things Dr. Redfield was mentioning earlier that might be done, like making a term appointment, as is done with the uh, director of the FBI, for example. Um, but I think that, like it or not, the, the, the Senate confirmation process is a measure of the credibility and importance that the uh, uh, congressional branch puts to the, the position. And I just find it an anomaly that uh, for reasons that just are historical, we've never caught up with the fact that the other counterpart agencies within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services the FDA commissioner, the NIH director, uh, the head of the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services, et cetera, are all Senate confirmed. This one should be as well. Now, if, if one wants to say that's a slow and difficult process, heavens, I agree. See what just is happening now with Ketanji Brown Jackson. I'm not a defender of the, of the efficiency of the Senate confirmation process, but I do think it adds real credibility to the person who is so chosen. Dr. Fagey. 
Well, I served as CDC director for both President Carter and President Reagan. It is possible to be in this position and not have it be political. I don't know the answer to Senate confirmation, but I worry that it could be a real problem in the future. So I think the department, HHS, has to totally depend on the director of CDC. And I can see problems if they don't feel that they can depend on it and that they have someone that's working against their best interests. So my bottom line is, I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure whether this is the right thing or not. D Dr. Redfield, let me ask you, the, the CDC obviously, it's, it's been very turbulent, obviously, with the, the pandemic um, under your tenure and the current tenure. Did you ever, um, did you ever have an opportunity to give um, Dr. Walensky any advice before she took over about sort of what you experienced? Yes, I did. I actually called her to congratulate her when her appointment was announced. Uh, like my colleague, Bill Roper, I told her one thing she wasn't going to get from me was public criticism. I had uh, the opportunity to have a number of CDC directors aggressively publicly criticize me. I didn't think that was helpful to the agency, and I told her she wasn't going to get that from me. Um, and I told her to have, you know, faith in her instincts. It's a great organization, An enormous number of men and women that are, you know, really committed to the public health of our nation and the world. Um, but I, and, and she should stick to what she believed and not get pressured into changing her point of view because somebody was trying to convince her that there was a political advantage to that change. Just stay true to herself. I, I have a lot of confidence and faith in her. Uh, and, you know, when people ask me to criti criticize the CDC director, I step back and tell them one thing I know for sure, as the colleagues are on this f uh, call know, one of the hardest jobs that I have ever had and probably ever will have was being the CDC director. So great deal of confidence in her, um, complicated job, a lot of political pressures on that job. She needs to stay true to herself. And, and continue and hopefully uh, the CDC directors that have come in the past will be supportive and non-critical of her. Is there anything that any of you could say, given you've all been in the hot seat in that job, anything you wish someone had told you that had been in that seat before you, before you took over, something you, you wish you had known? I mean, maybe I'll start since I was last. You know, I was um, really obviously honored to be given the opportunity to lead CDC, which I do believe is the greatest public health agency in the world. Um, I will say that I was shocked to see how under-resourced the agency was. And I give one example that I've said publicly before. Uh, the first uh, briefing I asked for in April was a briefing on uh, opiate-related deaths People know that one of my six children almost died from cocaine that was contaminated with fentanyl. Obviously, it was a big uh, priority for the president and the secretary. So I asked to be briefed on that. And I had a great briefing by real experts. We lost 80,000 people from uh, drug-related deaths that year. And when the briefing was over, I just asked a simple question. What was the data through? And the briefer looked at me and he said, well, uh, director, it was through uh, March 2015. And I said, but it's April 2018. And they said, yes, but, you know, director, you don't understand the complexity of gathering data from the states, making sure it's curated. I did say, and this is why my view on data modernization, I did say, you know, when I came here, I thought I was going to be leading the premier public health agency in the world, and that we were going to use data to make impact on public health. And what you're telling me is I'm a medical historian. So I do believe very strongly the importance of modernizing our data system so data comes in at a time that it's actionable. And I, and I think that was what I was totally shocked by because, you know, I had idolized CDC for my 30-year medical career thinking this was the top of the top. And to find out how under-resourced they are, this is why I said to you, one of my most important 
priorities is that our nation invests proportionally to CDC and public health. I personally believe that our national security is much more impacted by the capacity of our public health system in this nation than it is by North Korea, Iran, China, or, or Russia. And yet we don't invest proportionately to that. And we need to start to do that. And hopefully Congress will finally look that this is an agency that doesn't need five, eight, ten billion dollars. We need three to five aircraft carriers and they need to sustain that so that we can build a public health system in this nation. CDC can clearly lead it. I have no doubt about that, but they need the resources to do it. Dr. Roper, I see you're ready. Uh, say I totally agree with Dr. Redfield's points. Uh, but I want to link that back to uh, something Dr. Fagey said at the outset. Uh, to do the kind of modernization that Dr. Redfield is calling for over the data systems requires a, a basic change in the relationship between CDC and state and local health, the public health departments. Uh, for the most part, there are a few tiny exceptions, but for the most part, the information that the states give CDC, and that's the right word, give CDC, uh, is not um, is up to their goodwill. And so until we have uh, the ability to do the kind of modernization you've just heard about, we need to face the question, do we want, and I sure hope we do, do we want a standardized nationwide public health data system? If that's the case, then we can get the smart people together and design it and implement it across the 50 states plus the district and the territories and so on. But until we get that, in the current situation, every governor can basically say, no, I don't think we're going to do that. And, and that just blows the whole thing apart. We have to face this issue of who is running the system, which Dr. Fagey started with. Does any, before I move on, does anyone, does Dr. Fagey or Dr. Gerberding want to answer the question about what you wish someone had told you? I, I wish I had understood the resourcing of the CDC as well. When you look at the number on paper, it looks, wow, that's a great budget. We ought to be able to do a lot with this. But first of all, there's very little discretionary funding. So the line item process uh, pre-allocates the resources that are coming to very specific programs, which often are championed by people who need um, that investment, but also by congressionals who care about those issues. I think the other structural issue, other than the amount of money, is the fact that when uh, an emergency occurs, like we're experiencing right now, our Congress has been incredibly helpful in appropriating emergency funds. Those are one-time dollars, and you can't hire people on them or really build and expand the capacity of the system over time time. Those monies go away as soon as the crisis is over. And so we're left back at the zero uh, starting point again, where we really don't have any capacity to continuously improve both our bio preparedness, which I completely agree with, with Dr. Redfield is a matter of national security. But we also don't really make the sustained investments in health equity and health impact that we need for the chronic diseases and the other problems that people have. So we're basically operating a CDC in a public health system right now that's funded on a per capita basis less than it was in the 1950s in real dollars. And that just doesn't make any sense in this day and age. Dr. Fagey. Two quick points. Number one, advice that I got that was very valuable. My predecessor, Dr. David Sensor, let me know that every place in the world is both local and global. Therefore, anyone working on public health, any place, is working on global health. And the objective is global health equity. And if you have that in mind, it gives you a mission statement that you can proceed with. Number two, I support exactly what uh, the others are saying, that the resources are always so inadequate, except when we have an emergency. And then you think, but it doesn't come true, you think it's going to change. Now we're going to get enough resources to actually get an infrastructure. But we're always beggars. And we know that poor people think differently than rich people. And there's plenty of evidence that 
that uh, we were thinking always like poor people. We were begging for money. We didn't have a chance to say, here's the problem and this is what it would cost. And this is the infrastructure we have to go forward with. And people have made the, the comparison that if you go 20 years at an airport without an emergency, no one tries to reduce the budget for the emergency services at the airport. So why do they do that in public health? Because we don't have the same mentality. Let, let me say Dr. Frieden also has some, some interesting comments on the, on the budget and or the lack thereof. And I want, I want to run that clip in, in one second. And then right after that, we're getting lots, we've gotten lots of questions uh, from viewers. And I want to, I want to get to as many of, the, of, of them as I can in our, in our second half. Um, and also, you can type any additional questions into the live chat on YouTube. And again, I'll get to as many as I can. Uh, but let's, um, let's, let's go right to... Uh, the Freedom Clip uh, talking about a new approach or his, his approach to, to funding. We have to approach our nation's health defense with the same urgency we approach our military defense. In peacetime, we don't cut military and intelligence gathering capabilities so that we're at risk. Why then are we starving our health defenses when those threats are no longer in the headlines? We spend literally three to 500 times less on our health defense than we do on our military defense. And yet, no war in American history has killed a million people as COVID has in the past two years. If we had invested sufficiently in our health defense, most of these deaths could have been prevented. The HDO designation would ensure that critical public health defense functions have sustainable and sufficient funding, finally breaking that deadly cycle of panic and neglect. One, one thing I want to talk about on, on, on funding is, uh, I want to ask Dr. Gerberding, um, during your ten, tenure, you did try to tackle the budget system to give both the CDC and state agencies more flexible on spending, but it, it didn't succeed. What, can you tell us what happened and how you would advise the current leadership to tackle the issue? Uh, you know, it was it was an experiment in a sense. Uh, after meeting with many mayor uh, mayors and their health leaders, as well as governors and their health leaders, it became clear that the way the CDC budget arrives at the state in several different line items creates an administrative inefficiency, but it also means that decisions about what gets prioritized are really coming from the federal government to the states rather than maybe the other way around or at least some negotiation on what individual states and cities still are the priorities. So we tried to create a more flexible system where a state could establish its health priorities and then the CDC dollars could be used to support those priorities in a way that was still transparent and accountable. Um, that was a great idea on paper, and it received a fair amount of support from the state health officials, as you can imagine, but it set off some alarms for the people who had worked really hard to make sure that we had line item budgets for certain disease categories. And so there was a tension between what the states felt were important and what stakeholder groups felt were important. And I think if we go forward with this kind of notion, we're going to have to do a lot more groundwork first so that there isn't a either or situation, but rather we come together and agree on what the priorities are and then find more transparent and flexible ways and accountable ways to make sure that the right things get funded from the state and local perspective. I see, let, let me ask, let me throw in a question from a viewer named Nathaniel who asked if the CDC gets more authority over states, can or should the American public have greater oversight over the CDC? How can we ensure more transparency? Anyone want to tackle that? Well, it, it, CDC is a federal agency, and the oversight of federal agencies happens in a variety of ways, including the media coverage, et cetera. But the, the uh, official way it gets done is the congressional oversight process. And, uh, you know, again, I would just point out there's some problems with the way oversight is undertaken these days and the partisanship with which it is wrought. But uh, I, th I think there's ample 
avenues for that kind of transparent oversight if we just use them right. Speaking of partisanship, we published an analysis in STAT last summer that argued that we need to invest another $4.5 billion, which is, would be $13 per year per U.S. resident to adequately fund public health in this country. Um, if we think that that's a reasonable uh, investment, how can we break through the partisan divide in Congress to make the case for this? Can I just add one point of sure. view on this, just for completion? I think, sure. you know, we're talking about public health as a cost, that how much do we need to invest to accomplish modernization or improvement in our public health system? But we have to also think of it as an investment in health, in health protection, and in many cases in cost savings somewhere else in our federal or state or local budget because of the tremendous value that prevention, preparedness, and health protection really creates for people. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that prevention is scored by our government as an investment that has to be recouped in the same year in which the money is paid. That's, I don't want to get into the complexities of the Congressional Budget Office accounting, but we, we are not able to say if we invest X and in, say vaccination this year, down the road, we're going to save Y in diseases averted or cancers prevented, et cetera. The, the out year benefits don't really help in offsetting the investments that are coming through the appropriations process. So when Dr. Frieden was talking about modernizing the way we invest in our health protection system, he's really talking about changing the rules so that that kind of annual accounting could be more flexible and allow for more sustained regularized support. And Julie is, is absolutely right in that this has to be seen as an investment, not a cost. And one of the examples of this is the U.S. made an investment in smallpox eradication at a time when we didn't even have smallpox. But we were spending a lot of money vaccinating people and, and uh, treating their uh, adverse reactions from vaccination and so forth. Our investment after smallpox eradication has been recouped every three months, which means that since smallpox disappeared, our investment has come back 160 times what we put in. So if everyone understood that was an investment, they would say, yes, that was a great investment. And the same thing with immunization, that for every dollar we put into immunization, we get at least $10 back unless we use this short-sighted way of saying the benefits have to come back the year that you give the vaccination. Let, let me ask you, D D Dr. Feige, let me ask you about smallpox because you did uh, play a, a big role in that eradication. And the p pandemic certainly showed us that, that disease does not respect borders, yet we still see many Americans hes hesitant about spending tax dollars overseas. How does the CDC balance the priorities between global and domestic imperatives? The, we have to see ourselves as global health equity being our objective, no matter where we're working, and then balance it that way. We should have been giving much more vaccine globally at an earlier date with, with coronavirus than what we did, because it comes back to benefit us if we don't have new variants that are coming from Africa and other places because there's so much transmission. So it, we have to, from the beginning, see we are involved in global health and that we cannot walk away from that, that this is part of protecting us. Now, Dave Sensor at one point asked the question, how could we improve global health from CDC's point of view? And the answer was, we don't have a lot of money, but we have a lot of good managers. And so we were willing at CDC to put some of our best managers into places where global health decisions were being made. So D.A. Henderson was at WHO heading up the smallpox program for 11 years. Most people don't know. He was a CDC employee that entire time. Rafe Henderson was head of, of the Childhood Immunization Program. He was a CDC employee. 
Mike Merson was head of the diarrheal disease program, a CDC employee. Jonathan Mann was working on HIV, a CDC employee. This is the way we contributed to public health and we protected the US. Let me, um, let me ask um, uh, Dr. Uh, Gerberding uh, a question from Selena at NPR, uh, which is, uh, Dr. Gerberding, you, you led a restructuring of the agency when you were director, which was criticized by agency staff and reportedly negatively affected morale. Do you have lessons learned from that process to share with the current director? Well, first of all, I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on restructuring as a solution. And I'm not at all sure that restructuring solves any problem in an organization. If you have the right people and the right strategy, probably the structure isn't the most important issue. For me, the restructuring was primarily a consequence of the fact that when I came into the job, I had way too many direct reports and I had to think of a way to kind of bring folks together in scientific units that made sense. So the people involved in chronic diseases were in a cluster, the people in infectious diseases were in a cluster, et cetera. And I think that um, the, the lack of creating a burning platform, if you will, for making those changes was a, a rookie mistake on my part, because in order for people to really not be fearful of a restructuring and to move in that direction, they have to kind of see what's in it for me. And I wasn't very good at articulating that. I, I did find it somewhat amusing that when it was all said and done and Dr. Frieden came in, he pretty much ended up with a very similar organizational structure, which just tells you that it isn't how people are organized as much as it is having the right people and more more importantly, making sure that everyone understands what work needs to get done. So is, is, these are, you know, lessons learned, I would say. Yeah, is there, in, in those lessons learned, uh, is there a cautionary tale for uh, Director Walensky? Because she's talking about restructuring. It's the same thing that you've all tried. I mean, is it futile? Is it, is it you know, anyway? Oh, I, I really wouldn't want to second guess what Rochelle is looking at right now. A lot has changed at CDC since I've been there. And I, you know, I, I know from conversations I've had with her that she's very focused on the science and getting the science right. So I suspect if she's moving in any direction, it's really, really an effort to try to understand how to accelerate progress in the emergent sciences. And at the same time, you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We can't forget that the CDC is still in very operational mode. So it may w very well be an appropriate time to think about, are we really organized in sure. a way to continue what has become a marathon? <laughs> right. Dr. Redfield, you, you were looking to jump in. Did you have some? Well, I was just talking about the, the importance of investment in public health. I was gonna add, you know, when I was able to be the CDC director, one of the things that was clear to me was that we had 40,000 people a year uh, each year getting HIV infection, but we had all the tools to prevent that with, with antiretroviral therapy, with diagnosis, with treatment for prevention, and to try to begin to work with OMB to let them understand that when you looked at the 40,000 cases per year at over 10 years at, you know, 500, 600, 700, 800,000 dollars a person, you know, it got into enormous amount of money, a quarter to a half a trillion dollars. It made a lot more sense to invest in public health, uh, whether that was investment was a uh, hundred billion or $200 billion and, and try to help, you know, bring a, 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 an end to new infections with HIV. So I think it's so important, as Julie pointed out, it's not about the cost, it's about the savings. It's, you know, I would argue that in general, you know, investments in public health have substantial savings, not to mention the impact it has on the human condition. And unfortunately, the system, the way they do that, we were able to get it through OMB when I made the arguments, but it's complicated because they want to look at everything on an annual basis. And I think there's many ways that public health can generate substantial health savings and, and should be invested. I think the biggest issue that I will continue to say is that our proportional investment in public health is just highly inadequate. And we need to think about it. Like Tom said, I spent over 20 years in the Defense Department. 
we need to think about it proportional to our investment in the Defense Department. This is probably the greatest threat to the United States in terms of our way of life is not our relationship with North Korea or Iran or China or Russia. It's really the pandemic potential. And the fact is, we're not prepared for that pandemic potential. Even if we can get the science right, we don't have the manufacturing capability to be able to develop the countermeasures. And we really ought to re relook at the threats that we have in this nation and make public health one of the major investments that our nation makes uh, proportional to our Defense Department. Let me, let me jump in and, uh, uh, with a question for all of you about trust, because it's something we're hearing from a lot of, uh, obviously it's out there, we're hearing from a lot of viewers about this on this question. And let me, let me read one question from uh, a, a, a viewer named Tara, who says, as a journalist who has covered public health, including the CDC for well over a decade, I admit that I myself have lost all faith in the organization and feel a bit like I've lost my religion. What do you think the CDC can do and might actually do to regain the trust of those who know the organization far better than average people and yet feel completely betrayed by how the institution has abandoned its mission of public health in favor of promoting individual health and responsibility? Pretty strong words, but but you hear them everywhere. Anyone want to weigh in on that? Respond. Um, I just would say a couple of things, but I, I wasn't sure what that last sentence meant. So I, I that's why I looked a little quizzical when you read it uh, about individual responsibility. Yeah, why don't you why don't we drop the last sentence, but yeah. sort of the larger? Yeah. So it, it, trust is a big issue. Uh, Americans world, uh, worldwide, people have lost faith in institutions. CDC is uh, unfortunately a part of that. Um, I, without criticizing, and, and my colleagues have done this uh, uh, disclaimer, I'll do it myself. I'm not <laughs> criticizing any decisions recently made or done or whatever. But I think it's important that each time CDC or any other health uh, official makes a pronouncement to say with uh, humility, to use the fancy word epistemic humility, that we say, this is what we know today. And this is our best advice given what we know today. We may know tomorrow. And if it is, uh, if, if it is different from what we know today, we will change our advice tomorrow. But I think people are so anxious for a pronouncement from on high that is permanent and forevermore. And that's just not the scientific process. Um, I'm, I'm trying to call up my uh, uh, memory bank of, of famous quotes, but somebody, I think in politics, once said, um, when, when the facts change, I change my opinion. What do you do, sir? Um, I think it was a British statesman. But anyhow, that's the process we use. And people should not say that's crazy or CDC made a mistake or we can't trust them anymore. They should value the humility that's demonstrated when CDC directors and all the rest of us say, we're doing the best we can. When we learn more, it probably will change our advice, but that's what we know today. So if, so if I could ask, if someone else could jump in and say, what, what needs to be done to rebuild trust? What's the fastest, is it, is it doable? How do you do it specifically? You know, one comment I would make, um, I really do believe it's so important to create the structure of independence. This is why, you know, I happen to view that congressional approval of the CDC director is a positive thing, not a negative thing, but I understand the controversy. Um, I don't believe, I do believe that the CDC director being appointed for seven to 10 years, like the FBI director, the FBI director is not, his decision or her decision is not dependent on what the attorney general says. I think the structure right now is complicated. 
uh, where the CDC director is reporting to the Secretary of Health, who's deciding to weigh in on what happens. And then that's weighed in on the White House. And there may be a special advisor to the president on health like we have right now. I think there has to be a structural independence of the agency. So it should be moved out of, of HHS and be I just, I just think there needs to be structural independence. You know, the but, FBI is injustice, but there's structural independence. And I do think that we're seeing, I know I felt it in my t term, I'm not sure my colleagues what they felt, but I'm sure Rochelle feels it in her term. There needs to be structural independence for public health advice to the American public. So, would you, so you would stop short or would you stop short of making an independent agency? You know, to me, as I said, the FBI is in justice and they report to, you know, they're in the organization under the attorney general, but the FBI director is independent. I just want to see the CDC director be clearly independent in their decisions, whether they're part of HHS or whether they're not. I think that's less important. What's important is that they're independent. They're not, they're not having to discuss their recommendations with the secretary and have the secretary then modify what they want. They're not having to discuss those recommendations with the White House and have the White House. No, it needs to be an independent agency and the individual is going to be in that job for seven to 10 years and they give the best public health advice that they give to America. I think, I think it's the lack of perception of independence that has undercut trust. Dr. Uh, Gerberding, is that the biggest issue with trust, the lack of independence, or are there other issues? I, I think it's been an issue, is, especially in recent years, but I, I, I also think that it goes back to what Dr. Roper said earlier, that you know, CDC needs to be presented as the scientific resource in response to our public health requirements. And I think it's helpful to have that perspective emanating from Atlanta, not from other political components of our government. I think it's helpful to have that perspective articulated with the best scientists in the world standing beside the CDC director and offering their scientific opinion and perspective. And I think it's helpful to include the state and local public health officials who are also part of uh, the recommendations of the policy and the advice so that we are a public health system responding to the science. Probably one of the things that I'm secretly, um, I wouldn't say proud of because that's, that implies a, a lack of humility, but one of the inventions that occurred when I was the CDC director was the frequent use of the word interim, interim guidance for X, Y, and Z. And when we were able to use the word interim in the MMWRR guidance, it implied that this is what we know today this is what we are recommending based on what we know today. But guess what? <laughs> These recommendations are subject to a revision when we know more the science has evolved. And I'm, I'm happy to see that continuing, but I think that's the flavor of the message um, that we're all talking about, that people can handle uncertainty or ambiguity if they're told with humility that that's what's going on and they can appreciate and respect that you're working as hard as you can to get answers, but you don't have all the answers yet. So stay tuned, we'll update you tomorrow. Let me ask Dr. Fage, you you warned early in the pandemic that the CDC was losing its credibility with its reputation sinking from quote, gold to tarnished brass. Among the things that frustrated you was that you felt the agency had ceded its role as the authority for credible, timely public health information to pundits and academics. Do you still feel that way? How can the CDC regain its authority? Well, in, in, this is what uh, Dr. Redfield was talking about, having independence. And he was not allowed the independence he needed and he was being told by a White House how to do things. And we've had 225 years of modern public health since uh, Edward Jenner did that first smallpox vaccination in 1796. And we've learned a lot of things about uh, how science works and the need for having truth and the need for coalitions and the, uh, the avoidance of certainty, as Bill Roper was saying, that uh, we simply have to avoid the idea of certainty because uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist, was right. That is the Achilles heel of science, but also of politics and religion and everything else. And we've learned over the years 
that you have to do evaluation and keep changing what you're doing, that you need to respect the culture, that you have to combine, as Julie was saying, the science and the management in public health. You have to be working with politicians. You have to have a global uh, response. And my feeling was that the White House, the Trump White House was violating every one of those lessons learned. And so I came to, well, there's got to be another lesson here, which is lessons are useless if they're not regarded. Let me give Dr. Redfield a chance to respond. Do you, do you agree that the Trump White House violated all the, in those, all those instances, all those examples Dr. Feige is mentioning? No, I don't. I was actually very disappointed in Bill and his decision to uh, publicly criticize me fairly aggressively, but that's water under the bridge. I can say I always fought for the independence of public health. I'm not saying that people politically didn't try to influence those decisions. I say the one thing I've gained by being CDC director for three years in the Trump administration is every time that I go through a a airport now, uh, I, I trigger the um, metal detector because of all the shrapnel that's in my back, uh, even though I spent 20 years plus in the military and never got any shrapnel, including Pakistan. <laughs> Afghanistan. But um, I would say that those of us at CDC strove to try to maintain the public health message despite substantial pressure. Um, that's why I feel firmly about what I said here, that the agency would benefit, future ger- directors would benefit from structure, making the structure so it's very clear that it's independent with a seven to 10 year appointment. It's not in any command chain with the secretary. Um, so, uh, you know, I did the best I could, uh, as did my agency when I was there to promote what we believe to be the sound public health message and to promote that. Uh, despite others that may have other point of views about what they wanted to see. It was disappointing that some of my CDC director colleagues uh, felt uh, the necessity to publicly criticize me uh, in the news. Uh, 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 This is why with Rochelle, I made the first call I made. I said, she's never going to get that from me. I'm 100% in her camp. I know it's a tough job. If she wants my advice, give me a call. I'll give it. Um, but I'm praying for every day to be able to lead what I consider to be the premier public health agency in the world. I just would like to give it the tools to, to do its job. And that tool, most importantly, is the proportional investment that it's re- that's required for that agency to do its job. Let, let me add, we just have a couple minutes left. Let me ask you a couple very quick questions. One is, I'm wondering if this, um, this mistrust goes both ways. You know, there's been points during the pandemic when we've heard that the CDC has held back from releasing data or guidance because it didn't trust the public to understand and respond appropriately. Is that is that a problem? Uh, anyone want to jump in on that? Rick, let me uh, just respond to Dr. Redfield. I never did that publicly. It was a private letter with no one else involved. I never even consulted with anyone else and it was leaked from his office. So it was an attempt to give him my private uh, recommendation. Okay, on on the question of mistrust going both ways, does anyone fault the CDC for holding back? No one, no comment. No, I don't think, I, I can't comment on that because I have no information that CDC okay. held back anything. Okay. Um, I do think that it's always an, a natural instinct to think, oh boy, how are people going to react to this? We, we better make sure we think through mm-hmm. how this is presented. But I, I, it would really surprise me that information was held back because the public might not uh, respond in, in the way we hope they would. That's part of good emergency risk communication is to know how to present bad news in a way where you help people uh, find their way to do the right thing. Let me, let me final question um, that um, I think looks to the future that, that goes to this very question of uh, independence or not and politicization of the CDC. We've seen the Biden White House take a much more active role in public health issues that are typically reserved for the CDC because of the pandemic. Um, when do you all think it will be time for the task, the White House task force to wind down 
and have those roles go back to the CDC control. And related to that, has the White House's involvement been a help or a hindrance? Let's start with Dr. Roper. Um, so, so rather than answer your question, I'm gonna dodge it this way. Um, I think in general, we have way too many White House advisors on everything, not just health and public health and whatever, but there's a, a czar for this and a czar for that. What that does is uh, give the president, him or her, the ability to turn to their right or left and have somebody tell them what the latest is. But it also has the effect of disempowering the cabinet secretary who's in charge of health and human services and the CDC director who's the scientific agency director, et cetera. So having worked in two White Houses, Reagan and Bush, as the health advisor to each of those presidents, I'm strongly in favor of having many fewer White House staff doing these kinds of supposed coordinating things. Because unless you're very careful, the White House staff ends up doing what they did in the Vietnam War, and that is selecting the, the bombing targets and telling the generals where to drop the bombs. That, that's just not a good way to run a railroad. Dr. 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 Fe Dr. Feige, specifically, should the, should the White House uh, send some of these roles back to the CDC? Absolutely. I, I agree with uh, Bill Roper on this that uh, it becomes confusing because you get two different messages. And if CDC has to be checking the White House message every time, uh, that just inhibits good science. Dr. Redfield, do you agree with that? I agree with Bill. I mean, I think that they should have the CDC director ought to be driving the train. Very complicated, uh, you know, during my term with, the, with obviously the coronavirus task force. Um, and then obviously very complicated for Rochelle with now a senior medical advisor in the White House. I have a lot of respect for Tony Fauci, but I, my own view is that should be the CDC director. So I just think that uh, we ought to let the CDC director um, be the CDC director and lead this nation's public health response. Uh, Dr. Gerberding, what do you what do you think? Well, I feel strongly that we do need a national strategy for our health defense. And I believe that strategic function is best compiled across many cabinets at the White House level. But the CDCA is an operating division. It is the responsibility of the operating divisions to operate. And so I completely agree that the management of the execution of the public health functions for this pandemic or for other health threats really should be left to the agencies. And we don't need all of these complex coordinating bodies kind of checkered throughout our government. I'm, I'm gonna take, uh, we're supposed to end here, but I'm gonna take a minute and a half more moderator's uh, preference here. If you all can answer this question in 10 seconds or less, uh, and I'm gonna go around in a lightning round. And if you can't do it in 10 seconds, then let's, we'll skip you. And that is, What's the one thing you would do to restore public trust in the CDC? Dr. Fagey. I would try to come up with more transparency so people see what is happening. Dr. Redfield. Information fast and that we avoid certainty. Dr. Redfield. I would just say structurally reinforce their political independence. Dr. Roper. Be more outgoing and thoughtful and, and frequent with the communication from the CDC so that people understand the agency. And final word, Dr. Gerberding. Communicate, communicate, communicate. You guys are great. You, you all did it in less than the time allotted. So that's wonderful. We've um, had media training. Right, right. Well, you have. <laughs> Clearly, you've all done this before. Um, anyway, I, I, I really... Uh, I think this was a really thoughtful conversation. I hope Dr. Walensky watches this because I, she could pick up a thing or two, I'm sure. And, um, and what's interesting to me is not only your thoughtfulness, uh, but your, your passion for the agency and how uh, most of you agree more than disagree on, on most of these points. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's really helpful for the public discourse to have this conversation. And I thank you for participating. I thank 
all the all the viewers for taking the time out of your afternoon to to listen to this and to have your uh, to offer your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. If you missed any of this event, you can watch it on demand at the Harvard Chan School's YouTube channel, uh, and you can also check out other events in the Public Health on the Brink series at um, hsph.harvard.edu backslash brink. Thanks very much. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.